we have a, a few speakers lined up for you this morning and we will we'll be uh, going through the agenda for the first hour and then we have time for questions at the end at 11 o'clock to 11 30 we're going to open it up for questions and, and comments um, and we will uh, ask everyone to use the chat function so if you'll see on the bottom of your screen there's a chat box. If you click on that, you can put your questions in there. I'll have a look through the questions and I'll, I'll, I'll um, try and get them all uh, uh, posed to the speakers or respond to them as best we can. Um, we find that's the best way to do it through the chat because it, it's, it's the, the cleanest way without you know people unmuting and muting mics and things like that as well. So, so that's just a couple of procedural things. Um, I think we can probably kick off, um, even though there's probably a few more that will join us this morning. Um, so, um, my job, first of all, is to thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I'm incredibly proud to be able to welcome you all to the launch of our 2019 Impact Report um, for the Immigrant Council of Ireland, albeit in the somewhat unusual circumstances of doing it online, although we're getting used to this. I think we've done a couple of events now at this stage online, and it's a, quite an interesting format and works quite well in many cases. Um, so we're a national level human rights NGO and independent law centre that promotes the rights of immigrants and their families. Uh, we value and articulate the positive impacts of migration and diversity in Ireland and advocate, campaign and agitate for rights-based uh, approaches which remove barriers experienced by migrant communities. Some of those barriers are legal in nature, um, some are bureaucratic, like those which hinder the recovery process for victims of trafficking, um, and some are more overtly malicious, um, based on hate, fear, misinformation and inaction, such as those experienced by victims of racism and discrimination. Um, we find ourselves this week at a time when the, the fire of racial injustice globally, particularly in the United States, is blazing brightly um, and tensions are high as frustration, injustice and multi-generational disenfranchisement finds voice in protest and activism. I'm very conscious that I'm speaking to you here today as a white Irish male um, and I just want to take the opportunity to, to express my and our solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and with those who have taken to the street to demand change, both in the US and here in Ireland last weekend, um, at which we saw young black Irish people who spoke strongly about the issues they have faced and, 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 and the, the issues they are advocating for change in. Um, they're not an audience we need to convince of anything. They know the reality all too well, um, but we instead need to listen to them, all of us. And indeed we ignore the issues that they describe at our peril. We're lucky in Ireland that we have the opportunity to avoid the mistakes of elsewhere. We're at a crossroads as regards how we approach issues of migration, equality, racism and inclusion. And while there is much we need to address, there is also much we can get right. We lack in Ireland a strategic plan really for migration, um, including comprehensive immigration reform and access to justice for migrants. We need coordinated responses to racism like a national action plan. We lack hate crime legislation. We have poor levels of diversity in positions of authority in politics, in education, in the workplace and elsewhere. And consistently we hear of the barriers black people and others face in getting into things many of us in, in normal circumstances at least may take somewhat for granted, such as employment. Um, this cause is why we do what we do in the Immigrant Council. We seek real change to empower and to give voice and recognition to Ireland's diverse people and talents so that all of society may benefit. Uh, the work you will hear about this morning is pointed at these key areas. We do what we can as a small organization with a committed team of people um, with a wide network of allies and collaborators, some of whom you'll hear from this morning as well. Ireland's experience of diversity in any significant sense has developed over the past 20 years. And when we were established by Sister Stan Kennedy in 2001, we were tasked with the job of responding to the emerging needs of new communities in Ireland. Um, and indeed, in many regards, the word respond here is key. To a large extent, Ireland has reacted to migration rather than planned for it. This reactive response has led in many, to many instances of poor planning, poor investment, poor levels of development of the rights of those who have chosen Ireland as a new home. Some of the responses are well known, such as the continuing issues of direct provision. Some are hidden, such as the fact that much of the migration system is bureaucratic, slow and governed by discretion as opposed to enshrined and legally binding rights and entitlements. 
temporary solutions become long-term policies and while we fail to move forward and ensure that, that a rights-based approach those who live here can suffer long waiting times they meet barrier after barrier to progressing with their lives and they can experience deeply corrosive and damaging racist attitudes and discrimination which seek to remove their dignity their humanity this is not the experience for all but for those who experience it it, it, it cuts deep uh, not just for them, it damages all of us who are members of this society. We have to be conscious as well that it's not all negative. Polling has shown that the Irish public overall exhibit one of the most favourable positive attitudes to migration and diversity in Europe. Of this we must be proud. Our communities on the whole are diverse, vibrant and cohesive with a strong community spirit and often very inclusive practices both formal and informal. Ireland doesn't have a well-organized and politically impactful far right, save for a small number who would like that to be the case. Day by day, we see that the Irish public are welcoming, and we are home to many people who bring tremendous talent, energy, and dynamism to this country. This potential and this opportunity is ours to squander if we do not plan and invest in making sure that we do not take the roads taken by so many countries around us. This is a government responsibility, yes, and one which we would be impressing upon the incoming government, whenever that is. Um, but it is also a personal responsibility that each of us um, has a crucial role in. Again, I say this is why we do what we do. And again, I'm very proud to welcome you here today and show you some of the work we feel is relevant to achieving these broader aims. Um, our chair, Roja, will take you through some of the work we have focused on. And we will hear from some of those who we have supported and worked side by side with. And as I say, we will have time for questions later on at 11 a.m. So first of all, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Ruja Fazeli. Uh, Ruja is uh, the chair of the Immigrant Council of Ireland and is a, an assistant professor of Islamic civilizations at Trinity College uh, and warden of Trinity Hall. Um, Ruja has published many, uh, on, uh, many pieces on uh, the subjects of Islamic feminisms, female religious authorities, women's rights in Iran and the relationship between human rights and religion. Um, we're delighted to have Ruja as our chair and delighted to have her describe some of the work that we have done in the last number of years to you this morning. I'll hand you over to, to Ruja. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, I want to thank everyone once again for gathering here in difficult times. It's more important than ever for us to focus and dedicate ourselves to the work of tackling racism and migrant rights. I'm so honored and humbled as always to be uh, able to outline some of the key headlines from the Immigrant Council of Ireland's work throughout 2019. Um, and, and may I just say that the volume of work is as always overwhelming. So this is necessarily only a whistle, top, a whistle stop tour. Um, really just I'm going to highlight uh, some of the amazing work that Immigrant Council has done uh, in 2019. Um, our cornerstone remains the provision of information and legal services. This includes our dedicated helpline and independent law center. Our managing solicitor, Catherine Cosgrave, will talk in more detail about the work undertaken by the team during 2019. But I would like to draw attention to the uh, fact we answered more than 5,000 calls on issues including citizenship, family reunification, EU treaty rights, and work permits. Every call is a person with a concern, and I am so proud of the consistent professionalism and also thoughtful care provided by those on the helpline. Due to the pro bono support from Arthur Cox, which already sponsors a legal intern um, on a rotating basis, we were absolutely delighted to be able to extend the hours the helpline is open. So may I thank Arthur Cox once again for this. 30 lawyers were trained to be volunteer helpline staff from October onwards, and this enabled us to offer an evening service from 7 to 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. During 2019, our independent law center was kept busy, prioritizing some important high court cases and kicking off a new partnership program with the Irish Refugee Council and US Kind, Kids in Need of Defense. 
The program coordinates specialized legal support via, uh, via pro bono partners to unaccompanied refugee children. Our pro bono partners include Arthur Cox, ANL Goodbody, LinkedIn, and Microsoft. We took five high court cases during 2019. Among them, I want to draw your attention to the high court case we won in July, which related to the citizenship application of of a seven-year-old girl. The application had been refused on the grounds the good character test had been failed. The failure did not relate to the little girl, but instead to her father. Among the evidence against him were conviction for domestic abuse. Our legal team took a judicial review against this decision, which, is all, which it ultimately won. The High Court noted in its judgment that it was unable to find any example from any other country where the eligibility conditions of a child to apply for naturalization would be predicated on the good character of the parent through whom the application was submitted. For us, the heart of the ruling was the recognition of a child's right to be heard and independently assessed. As a human rights organization with a feminist lens, we prioritize women and children made vulnerable by exploitation. So in 2019, we continued to provide crucial legal information and support to victims of trafficking, supporting 27 women during 2019. I urge you to take the time to read Elena's amazing story in this report. Trafficked from South America into Ireland for the purposes of sexual exploitation, she had the courage to escape despite threats against her family. While being supported by the Immigrant Council, she re-engaged with her studies and within six months was fluent in English. She no longer needed a translator. We also continued to lobby for better supports on a national and international stage. And I'm proud to say that as a direct result of our advocacy efforts, a recommendation to create gender specific accommodation with additional supports and services for victims of trafficking was included in the report on direct provision and international protection application process. This was published by Joint Oroctus Committee on Justice and Equality in December. In addition, our expert anti-trafficking research team was awarded EU funding to head up an innovative new project with five feminist partner organizations from across, across Europe. The project includes provision to train trafficked survivors to become peer mentors. This project named ASSIST will provide legal advice and develop improved approaches to integration for trafficked migrant women recovered from sexual exploitation. With regard uh, to tackling racism, I want to again highlight the ongoing partnership with Transport for Ireland and Dublin City Council on the nationwide transport against racism campaign. Yet more commuters donated their selfies during the summer of 2019 and pledged uh, to hashtag join us on the journey to end racism on Irish public transport. I hope many of you saw these posters and I hope many contributed yourself. We also exchange, um, engaged with the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which was examining Ireland's actions in this area um, at the end of 2019. We contributed a detailed report on the issues faced in Ireland and attended the state's examination by the committee in December. We were encouraged when their report included recommendations on all the main issues we raised, including uh, widely the need for one, a new fully resourced national action plan against, race, against racism, and two, effective hate crime legislation. We can use these recommendations from the world's leading watchdog on racial discrimination to both inform and fuel our ongoing lobbying of the Irish government to better tackle racial discrimination and crucially to work to prevent it. Encouraging and promoting migrant political participation remained a key focus during 2019. While one in eight of us is from a migrant background, migrant representation in our political system lags significantly. Following 2019's local elections in May, just nine out of 949 local councillors across Ireland 
are from a migrant background. Working towards fairer representation is essential for building a stronger, more integrated society. It also sends a powerful message to people from all backgrounds that Ireland is their home and that they belong and are wanted here. During 2019, the Immigrant Council of Ireland undertook a program of work promoting migrant political participation. This included focused workshop for prospective migrant local election candidates, nonpartisan one-to-one -one support and advice for pros uh, prospective migrant election, or local election candidates, meeting with political parties to facilitate discussion and present information to improve migrant political participation. Regular outreach workshops on electoral rights with people from a migrant background. Migrant counselor internship that saw five migrants intern with counselors in 2018. A report on this process was launched in February 2019. And um, I believe that you will hear more about this from two participants uh, today, Anne and Joe, who, who will follow me. Um, and our um, hashtag go vote video campaign, which was launched in November 2018 and rerun in April 2019 ahead of the local elections. There were over 230,000 views of these 10 professionally produced multilingual videos that included voter registration information and details on how to vote. As part of our advocacy efforts, we were also honored to welcome Antisha Leo Varadkar to open our integration and inclusion conference in November. The particular value of this conference stemmed from the fact it brought together a huge range of expertise and insight on the issue of migrant integration, crucially, um, and provided a space to exchange ideas. Alongside international experts from the US and Portugal, where migrant community groups, asylum seekers, departmental officials, policymakers, partner organizations, and government agencies. The areas covered included tackling racism, employment, housing, direct provision, sport, and migrant leadership. The conversations there were rich and even more importantly, are still ongoing. So these are just a handful of highlights among a rich tapestry of effort and impact. I urge you all to look at the report and see more for yourselves. And while this is an opportunity to reflect on the achievement of 2019, we know, uh, we, we, know we must remain forward facing. We will continue to strive for progress in the protection, fulfillment and realization of migrant rights in 2020 and of course beyond. And with that, um, I will hand you back to Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruja. Um, and thank you for the whistle stop tour of the work. And, and as, as I've been saying this morning, while it is a, a collection of the work that we do in the Immigrant Council of Ireland and an opportunity to speak about it, really what it is as well is a, is a barometer or maybe a finger on the pulse of some of the main issues that, that we believe are, are facing people from a migrant background in Ireland has come through our services and our projects, but not indeed an exhaustive list uh, as there are, there are many others um, that we do not uh, necessarily have the resources to engage with. Um, but as I say, we do what we can. Um, so thank you very much for that, Ruja. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to Annie Watura Burke. Annie uh, originally comes from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, she's a naturalized Irish citizen who has been living in Ireland since 2007. She started her activism in Kenya where she was involved in the Students' Union at Nairobi where, when she was studying political science. She campaigns against female genital mutilation and other issues which highlight the gender imbalance for girls. She uses modeling, music, dance and art as mediums to empower girls from a migrant background to tell their stories. She currently lives in Greystones and took part in the Immigrant Council or the Immigrant Council of Ireland's Councillor Migrant Scheme in 2008. Uh, Annie Wren in the May 2019 local elections as a Labour candidate in the Greystones electoral area. So we're delighted to have you to here this morning, Annie, and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Brian. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, sorry, I'm going to probably be looking down because I've written quite a bit of notes. I promise I'll try to keep it under the 10 minutes. So forgive me if I take too long. Um, 
first things first, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak here today, but as well as the opportunity um, to actually take part in the um, in the political kind of internship, um, which I took in 2018, and I had the pleasure of working with Joe Behan. Um, so just to let you know, this is an absolutely amazing opportunity. And it is paramount to have true representation of Ireland at a decision-making level and in all aspects of life in Ireland. But having said that, having a voice is of utmost importance so that we can protect, preserve and save lives. A lot of things in Ireland are avoidable especially when it comes to if we can understand each other. And I'm sorry to say, but in recent times, it has become very much painful to see what is happening around the world in regards to discrimination, to racism, to even the killing of people of different races. Having said that the death of George Floyd has actually you know, ignited a fire under the Irish people and under the people around the world to actually stand up and voice out the fact that there has to be change. And for that, we thank people and organizations like ICI, the Irish Council of Ireland, and Akidwa for their continued work to fight this kind of thing and making our voices heard at every level. So for that, we thank you. The one thing that actually is really, really frustrating and heartbreaking at the moment is the fact that, yes, Ireland is one of the best places for a migrant to live, but we can no longer live in denial that the fact that things like racism, discrimination, and unfair representation is at the heart of our country, meaning at government level. One thing that I have to wait or to ask everyone is to think, why is it that we have to wait for things to become so bad, or when a tragedy hits, so that we can wake up and voice ourselves. We can see the train wreck coming. With not having true representation, we can see it coming. There's so much hate being ignited by such of the likes of Gemma, such of the likes of other people around the country, yet we do not see anything happening. Organizations like INA working for the fact that we're working towards a legislation that has been worked on so many times, but yet has not been implemented. So one thing that I would say is, in this kind of situation, the program that ICI was running is the most brilliant way of empowering us as migrants but even us as Irish people, because we need that information out there for the Irish people to understand us as migrants, but on the other side, as well as migrants to integrate and understand the Irish people and the legislation and the laws that they have. So for, for everybody here, I would encourage, if you have any way of encouraging the next person to take part in such a beautiful initiative, Please do, because through this, I met Joe Behan, who actually ignited the love and the passion that I have for politics again, because I had lost hope in it. And through Joe Behan, I can sincerely say, I learned so much, and not just Joe Behan, but Joe O'Brien, to the fact that I learned that I can actually run for elections at local level, and everybody can vote, which I did not know. So regardless of your background, whether you're an asylum seeker, in direct provision or anywhere else, you can actually vote, meaning you can use your voice to put the right person into power to represent you. So we do not need to live in a, in a way that, you know, we have to wait until that Irish person represents you. Why can we not have a Polish person? It was amazing that this year we had over 50 migrants running and only nine of us got in. But we all got our voices out there. 
our stories were heard and it ignited again a fire in Ireland, meaning hopefully in the next five years, we'll have more people running, me included. So I'm enjoying, and having said that, I'm hoping all of you will vote for me when I'm running for Taoiseach. Again, in a few years, we'll wait and see. It depends if Joe and Pepper and everyone else can convince me to actually do that. But in the meantime, I will leave you with this. If you have the passion for change and you have the passion to voice out and be a voice for those who cannot, you know, stand up for themselves or speak for themselves, I'm encouraging you to actually go out there and be that voice. Because without you, without places like ICI, without places like Akidwa, we are lost. And we need all of us to stand up together. It might not be now, in a year's time, in five years' time, it does not matter. Because you have to think our next generation need us. I do this for my kids so that they don't have to live the hurt, the racism, the discrimination, and worst of all, the feeling of being invisible with nowhere to go in Ireland, a place I call home and where my heart belongs. So this is for my kids and for their kids and their generations to come. So I hope all of you will join us. And please, when you hear the call for the next ICI program, please do join because it's gonna be amazing and you will enjoy every bit of it. And it will be nice to see each and every face in five years running for elections. So hopefully that has put a fire under your chair and I will see you again very shortly. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, guys. I'll hand it back to Brian. Thank you, Annie. Um, that's fantastic. I don't know if you can see in the gallery view there, but you're getting silent applause. Yay. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. And I have to say, you know, one of the privileges of our work is, is that, you know, the privilege is all ours, really, that we get to meet fantastic people like yourself. And that truly did light and fire. So fair play to you. Uh, I think we can leave it there, actually, to be honest. I think we'll just wrap it up. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. But listen, thank you so much for that. Um, and um, just a, a word on the internship scheme. Uh, we, will, we will be running that again later in the year as soon as we know what the COVID restrictions are and then they're gone away and we can actually have people meeting in person as opposed to virtually. So so thank you, Annie. Um, you mentioned Councillor Joe Behan, and we'll go on to Joe next. Uh, Councillor Joe Behan is an independent member of Wicklow County Council and has served as a public representative since 1985. He has assisted local voluntary groups in their, lo um, in their work in local communities. Um, between 2007 and 2011, Councillor Beaton was a TD for Wicklow as well. Um, a trained primary school teacher, um, he seeks to listen to and represent people in vulnerable situations, including defending the rights of older people and seeking to improve resourcing for children with special education needs. Um, Joe has worked uh, with many local people and community groups to develop community facilities around sports and recreational parks, libraries, playgrounds and public open spaces. And as Annie mentioned, Joe was one of the councillors who participated in the last version of our internship scheme in uh, 2018. So I'll hand you over to, to Councillor Joe Bean. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, good morning to everybody. And first of all, I just want to say, Annie, you took my breath away. You know, th those words you expressed, I think, as Brian has said, almost nothing further needs to be said. How you put your, your message to all of us who are listening to you, and I hope to the wider, wider population of this country, was absolutely eloquent and heartfelt and sincere. And there's no doubt that your voice in the future will be heard, Annie, and it deserves to be heard. And, you know, one of the huge advantages for me in signing up to the internship scheme was that I actually got to know Annie, got to meet Annie, and I got to work with her. And while she may have learned something from me, I can tell you that I learned so much more from her. Because by interacting, by working with Annie as part of the internship scheme, I came to see for the first time 
the barriers that immigrants, that migrants coming into this country face every day of their lives and the difficulties they have in negotiating uh, with all of the state bodies in terms of housing, in terms of education, in terms of all of the other basic necessities of life, uh, I could see it at first hand. And to me, I suppose it was an education as much as anything, as, as anything that I might have done to help Annie. Also, from a political point of view, one of the things we did was Annie came to Wicklow County Council meeting, sat in the public gallery, as a practical experience, if you like, for her to see what would be happening at the council level and how she would be able to contribute if she, if she got elected. And I was very struck with her perception of what she saw in Wicklow County Council at the time, which was a male and an elderly body and a predominantly, uh, totally actually, a white uh, assembly, if you like. And, and I suppose I had never really seen it that way until Annie showed, showed it to me through her eyes. And that's why we worked together. She came with me when we went door knocking in different parts of the constituency, particularly in the Greystones area. She, we talked about what her pitch should be to the voters, how she should approach people when, when she knocks on a, door, on a door on a practical level, what way to kind of canvas, what way to listen to what people and note their problems and try and resolve them for them. And uh, she also helped me in terms of social media uh, and how she is so adept herself at social media channels. I'm working that and I'd say she's probably tweeting away there now as we're talking uh, this morning. And uh, as I say, I learned so much from you, Annie, but I, I also feel in the context of everything that's happening today in the world and people becoming awakened to the huge levels of discrimination that still, still exist not only in faraway places like the USA, but here in this country, that uh, this forum and other fora like it in the future need to be front and centre for all of the people of this country, and in particular at the highest levels in Dáil Éireann. We have a programme for government being negotiated at the moment, and I hope, as Brian, I think you expressed also the hope, that migrant issues will be top, front and centre in those negotiations. Mind you, I haven't heard too much coming in terms of the media leaks from those talks. So uh, hopefully we're not being too optimistic, but I think it's essential. And I think the people of this country would support the objectives of the Immigrant Council of Ireland in what you want to do. And as, you, as, as the chairperson set out so eloquently at the start, how all of the things that are wrong in this country at the moment that need to be righted, that we all need to get together to ensure that those solutions are provided. Uh, but Annie, uh, also made a very big impact in Wicklow and running in the local elections. She, I, I'm an independent, she ran for the Labour Party in the end and I know she got good backing from the Labour Party organisation there in Greystones. And I would say to anybody who's listening or anybody who in the future is considering running for politics, at the end of the day it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter whether it's with a party or as an independent. I think the most important thing is to go out there and offer your services to be the voice of the people. And when people come to you with problems, one of the bits of advice I did give Annie was that in order to be successful, a candidate going forward for election from a migrant background, I think needs to also show that they're willing to take on the problems of people, no matter who they are, what their background is in their community, particularly at local level. Uh, not, if you like, just to concentrate on, on the people that might be of migrant background, but to kind of offer your services to everybody. Because that's, I think, another example of integration and something that we all should be striving for in the future. I would highly recommend the internship scheme to other public representatives who may be listening to this. In fact, I would go so, go so far as to say that if the Immigrant Council of Ireland were able to, I would ask that they would write to each county council in the country and offer to make a presentation on the internship scheme to elicit volunteers from councils right across the country to see if councillors would be willing to do what I and others did, which was to mentor those of you from the migrant community who might be considering running for election in the future. I think many councillors, if they were more aware of this scheme, I think would be very happy to participate. I'm certainly glad I participated. I'm looking forward to Annie's future success in politics because we need you, Annie. We need people like you very, very badly. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention and good luck to the Immigrant Council of Ireland. Thank you.
Thank you, Joe, um, and thank you for that input. Uh, this is fantastic, um, and I think that is a great idea, as you say, to you know definitely make make the internship scheme uh, uh, make councillors across the country aware of it, and perhaps now that we're more with with the online format, we can do online presentations whereby we can get people like yourself and Annie to come in and talk about the benefits of it, and we may be more likely to get people coming in for a look uh, if we do it online. So, so thank you very much. As I say, we will definitely be doing it again, and we'll, we'll figure out the time frame and advertise it as soon as we can once we know what kind of restrictions are, are lifted from us in the future. Um, so thank you for that, Joe, and thank you for that, Annie, for, for highlighting some of the work we do on the integration side of the house around political participation. And as I say, it's, it's, it's a, an honour and a privilege for us to get to meet people like yourselves uh, through that work. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to Catherine Cosgrave. Uh, Catherine is the Managing Solicitor of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, and she heads up our legal and information work. Catherine's a, a specialised migration and human rights lawyer and has, is the author of several leading publications relating to family and child migration, trafficking and citizenship. Um, in addition to legal practice, she's worked as a legal trainer and consultant and lecturer um, at the University of Limerick and Dublin Institute of Technology. Um, so, so we're uh, particularly fortunate and delighted to have Catherine managing up our legal work. And I'll hand you over to Catherine now to tell you about some of that work. Catherine? You're still muted, Catherine. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. I thought it would automatically unmute. So good morning, everybody. Um, as Managing Solicitor of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, I have responsibility for delivery of our information and legal services, as well as the provision of legal education and training um, and the implementation of a number of EU projects. All of that work is very generously supported by a number of funders, in particular Pubble through the SSNO Fund, the Citizens Information Board, the Community Foundation of Ireland and uh, the European Commission, um, as well as indirectly by a number of our pro bono partners, as Roja has already mentioned. Um, I'd like to thank all of those organizations uh, for supporting the work and also to thank our partners across uh, Europe, in particular our lead partner, the International Commission of Jurists in the Fair Plus project. Uh, we're very grateful to them all and uh, look forward to continuing uh, with working with you uh, this year also. Roja gave you a, a snapshot of uh, what was an extremely busy year for a, quite a small team and it would be totally remiss if I didn't give a shout out and thanks to my small team, Colin Lenehan, Mary Henderson, Katharina Granditz and Siobhan Johnson, all staff at the Immigrant Council, uh, but also to thank Blaheen Shiel, Neve Eggleston and Fiona Hughes for their contribution while they were on secondment at different times throughout the year uh, from our pro bono partner firm, Arthur Cox. Um, with the exception of Colin and myself, all team members were new to the Immigrant Council and they all dived in at the deep end and worked really exceptionally very hard, both internally and externally, representing the organization in different fora uh, and helping individuals to navigate the migration to obtain successful outcomes. Roja mentioned that uh, the team, specifically Colin and Katharina, responded to uh, 5,035 helpline calls uh, either received from individuals or staff of external organizations working with migrants and their families. That represented a 40% increase in calls on the previous year. And of those calls, about 1,400 of them uh, came from the citizens information staff and volunteers across 71 separate citizens information service centers across the country. Um, notably, uh, nearly 200 of those queries came from outside of Ireland from 27 different countries right across the EU and also across the USA, Canada, Australia, Africa, Asia and the Middle East. Uh, 148 different nationalities contacted the service and I think that service is a very stark reminder that the statistics from our helpline service reflect the national geographic reach of the organization but more particularly underscores the demographic diversity of communities in Ireland uh, both urban and rural. The increase in the calls both from the CICs and to our helpline I think reflects uh, the significant number of policy announcements that were made by the Irish Naturalisation and Immigration Service throughout the year or decisions of the High Court relating to very critical issues affecting our service users including the regularisation of immigration status 
family reunification, visas, the introduction of pre-clearance schemes, continuous residence requirements for citizenship applicants, and in particular for the year that was in it, the potential implications of Brexit on British citizens and the resident status of their family members who are not British citizens. And despite the busy services, we do remain acutely conscious of the fact that we can't provide assistance to everyone who seeks to access the services and that we do remain inaccessible to many individuals, either by virtue of their or our location, uh, the limited availability of language supports that we can provide, and indeed our limited opening hours. And Roja has already reflected and extended our thanks to the uh, staff at Arthur Cox who approached us and said that they would like to assist us to extend our reach by uh, undertaking volunteer training and providing a, a service on Tuesday evenings on a voluntary basis. And that's uh, been really excellent and is still ongoing at the moment. In addition to the helpline calls, uh, the Law Centre um, that the Immigrant Council has also provided assistance in 199 cases. With previous years, uh, we continue to afford priority to cases of acute vulnerability. Supports were provided to 27 victims of trafficking at various different stages of the identification process or in other matters related to applications for family reunification or in a small number of cases where individuals have remained in Ireland for a number of years, access to citizenship or dealing with other matters related to accommodation, social welfare and education grants. We also maintained our focus on migrant children and 45 case files were opened relating to children. Uh, the key issues for those related to unaccompanied minors uh, applying for family reunification or access to appropriate residence status for children, particularly where they have been in care. Um, already mentioned by Roja, we were delighted to win the High Court case relating to our child who had been refused uh, a citizenship. Sadly to note that despite that victory, the Department of Justice has not yet taken a decision in her application following the decision of the High Court to quash the decision that had originally been taken. So we continue to fight at that front. Uh, we also issued proceedings in a number of unaccompanied minor family reunification cases, including the 12 month rule. Um, sadly, we lost a case uh, on that point uh, in a judgment issued by the High Court last November, but the matter is on leapfrog appeal to the Supreme Court and pending a hearing date uh, just at the end of this month. And it would be remiss if I didn't also thank all of uh, the barristers, junior and senior, who assist us throughout the year, not just in our formal High Court proceedings, but uh, providing advice and always at the end of a telephone uh, when we need uh, to get a bit of additional direction in a matter. Um, already mentioned by Roja, we were really delighted to partner with US Kids in Needs of Defence this past year um, and also with the Irish Refugee Council to extend the pro bono partnership that we enjoy with Arthur Cox to uh, Brian mentioned companies such as Microsoft and LinkedIn, but also other law firms in El Goodbody and Simmons and Simmons. Following the training that was provided by the staff of the Immigrant Council and the Irish Refugee Council to the lawyers of those firms and in-house counsel working in companies, we're now all working collaboratively to ensure that unaccompanied children have access to the necessary legal advice and representation that they require in order to get through the family reunification procedure. And the reason for this pro bono project is because of the absence of state civil legal aid to support those children with those applications. And we were particularly pleased that the Council of Europe highlighted the services provided by the Immigrant Council to these migrant children as a best practice example of child friendly justice procedures. In addition to gender based violence and the issues facing children on the move, a key priority issue for the Law Centre over the past decade has been to address the acute issues faced by stateless persons in Ireland. Statelessness is a serious human rights violation and it receives very little attention here in Ireland. Uh, despite the fact that Ireland has ratified relevant international instruments, Ireland lacks a formal stateless determination procedure. And consequently, even the rights that stateless persons have been provided with for under domestic law, such as access to citizenship, they remain inaccessible to the individuals they were intended to assist. In 2019, therefore, we were really delighted following submissions to the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination to secure a recommendation to Ireland on the introduction of a stateless determination procedure. And it is sincerely our hope that the new government when formed will act on that recommendation. To address you more fully on the issue of statelessness, uh, we'll be handing over to one of our uh, long-term clients of the Law Centre, Heikel, who will speak in just a couple of moments. 
for him, I would personally like to express my thanks to Heiko and indeed to all of our service users. It takes real courage for them to disclose matters, sometimes which are extremely personal and distressing in nature and where it's necessary to engage in litigation against the state, especially when there is no prospect of damages being secured of a financial nature. And the only hope is really to set a positive legal precedent for other people who may be similarly affected. It also takes years for some of our clients to obtain a final resolution in their case. And we're really very, very grateful to them uh, for uh, sharing their life experiences with us. Um, but particularly when they keep in contact with us afterwards, take the time to get involved in the work of the organization. And most especially uh, reach out to us to send us kind notes and positive words of encouragement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and as you say, it provides a, a great segue into introducing Heiko to you. Um, and we're delighted to introduce Heiko to you. He's uh, someone that's been uh, interacting with the organization for the last number of years um, and is a phenomenal, a phenomenal young man. Um, Heiko Mansour uh, dreams of becoming a doctor, um, but has faced barrier after barrier because of his, uh, the Irish government does not formally recognize that he, like thousands of Rohingya, are stateless. Um, nevertheless, since arriving in Ireland in 2010 to, pursuing his to pursue his medical studies, he has completed a degree in the medical field at NUI Galway and thrown himself into voluntary work, supporting his local community in Carlo and linking in with the Rohingya community in Burma and in refugee camps in Bangladesh uh, to promote their rights. He is the co-founder of Rohingya Action Ireland and Rohingya Medics Organisation and is also General Secretary of the European Rohingya Council. Over the past couple of months, Heikal has been very busy providing medical information and advice to Rohingya in refugee camps. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce you to Heikal and I'll hand you over to him now. Thank you very much. A very good morning to everyone from Carlo. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Professor Roger, uh, Catherine and, and uh, Councillor Joe uh, for their kind words and wonderful, beautiful words. Um, I'm extremely uh, honored and humbled to join you from, uh, from, from, the, from the lockdown. I hope everyone is safe and strong during this very difficult time. Um, I especially thank everyone at Immigrant Council of Ireland, which I deeply consider as a family. And I also congratulate uh, all the staff uh, at the Council for the, for the launch of Impact Report 2019. And I hope it paves the way to fix the deeply flawed systems of immigration in Ireland. And I would like to say no immigration system is perfect, but it needs a reform to, to, to make it better. And I would like to acknowledge and show my solidarity with the people who are affected by the flaws here, and also the rise of racism across the world. And every step that the department takes affect an individual life. Positive results in, the, in rebuilding of a life in new home in Ireland, and negative takes a step in the disruptions of a life. For me, a decision was made by the department on June 22nd in 2011 that has changed my life. For the, ne for the next seven years, I was barely into my being as a person deeply traumatized shattered million pieces inside and and the shadow cast beyond any glimpse of hope and light and my applications for asylum was rejected claiming i had no fear of being persecuted uh, in in my native country burma despite the well-documented evidence of the ongoing genocide against our community in burma and despite the uh, the irish government funded one of the first major research on Rohingya called Crimes Against Humanity in Western Burma, the Situations of Rohingya, that was published in 2010 uh, at NUI Irish Center for Human Rights. And despite I have proven documentations after documentation uh, on the fear of my persecution, my, my asylum application was still rejected and I was on deportation order. And the decision cost me my career, my education, my well, mental well-being, and my hope of rebuilding a home in Ireland. And there are many people in this country who, who came 
seeking a hope and seeking a place of sanctuary, and they ended up traumatized and rejected by the flawed system. After seven years of trying uh, uh, to break the darkness uh, with the resilience and trying to put pieces of me together uh, with a grain of hope, I was finally granted STEM for on the basics of a state, statelessness, which is nothing more than a trap because uh, Ireland doesn't have a stateless determination procedure. And people like me with a similar status are living in limbo. I consider no one is stateless. The country's flawed system, discriminatory policy create a statelessness. I'm not a stateless um, either. My parents, my grandparents were the citizens of Burma uh, until 1982 citizenship law was uh, uh, introduced by the Burmese military regime, uh, stripping our ethnic and nationality rights. I had a state, I had a birthplace, I had a home. I left it because there is profound fear. I left it because there is no hope. I left it because I see hope somewhere else. And no one wants to leave uh, the home where one was born, and no one wants to leave a mother who gives a life. And it was because of my mom uh, that I, I left seeking my dream. I developed uh, severe depressions after being denied to, uh, to attend a government medical school uh, in, in Burma, despite I was granted a place uh, to study. But I was denied simply because I belonged to the Rohingya community, for which medical education is completely prohibited, and then uh, healthcare is extremely limited. And my mom convinced me uh, uh, one day, and her words are very powerful. I always use these words to, to when I talk about my situation because it carries a lot, it changed me my, and my destination. And she said, I can die a thousand times being away from you with an education, but I cannot allow myself to die once being with you uh, in a place where there is no hope and no education for you. And this made me to travel all the way from Burma to seeking a hope. And she often told me to build a home in my final destination. And she often reminded me to take care, love my new home, and decorate my new home with the strength of hope, faith, love, and dream. I'm in my early 30s. I'm not, I'm not young enough now. And I have, I have never experienced what it feels like being a citizen of a country. I have spent nearly a third of my pre, uh, precious and productive, productive life here in Limbo in a wonderful country surrounded by wonderful Irish friends, neighbors, colleagues, and teachers. But I failed to build the home that my, my mom wishes and I have dreamed. I, ha I haven't given a chance to build that home, a home filled with hope, warmness, love, tranquility, belongingness, and the sense of responsibility. And Rohingya friends and leaders from several European countries uh, and UK asked me to move out of Ireland to seek asylum and continue my medical education as they see no hope for me in Ireland because of uh, stateless determination procedure. I told them, no, I'm not going out of Ireland so too soon. And in spite of my status and the flawed system, I've, I feel I have a sense of responsibility to contribute to this amazing Irish society where I've, I, see, I still see a glimpse of hope and where our Rohingya community were resettled from refugee camp. I saw plenty, many times, the seed of hope were implanted to many Rohingya youths and girls, boys and girls in Ireland. And in spite of my limited freedom, I feel I have a duty to bridge uh, my, our resettled Rohingya to the new home through integrations and integration and inclusion. And in spite of my health, I felt honored to join our Rohingya community in reviving one of the, one of the oldest Carlo, uh, uh, cricket clubs in Ireland called Carlo Cricket Club, which was uh, closed down in 1982. And in spite of my broken uh, heart and dream, 
I feel I have a strength to, continue to contribute in the fight for justice for our persecuted Rohingya community through various uh, human rights organizations. And in spite of uh, the break in my career, I have desired to educate race awareness through Rohingya Medics organization during this very difficult time. And in spite of living in limbo, I'm proud to associate with this wonderful society. An Immigrant Council of Ireland has been an, a very stunned supporter of my case. The professionalism, dedication, and the compassion of the council has further strengthened my hope I still remember the first time I met uh, Catherine Cosgrave in, in the office, uh, which was on February 27 in 2017. And after living without a pa paper for seven years, for several years, uh, she along with Katie, Colin and many others have given time, energy and their expertise to rekindle my, my hope. And it has not been easy uh, case for, for them because that because of the lack of uh, statelessness uh, procedure in Ireland. And it is because of them I still dream to come out of this uh, limbo and is to stay in Ireland. And I, ho I hope I, I will stay in Ireland and to rebuild my home in Ireland. And when, so when, when someone is provided an opportunity with, an, with no added stress and injustice, one can surely be ready to contribute and feel proud of it. And so many people lost their productive years because of the flawed system. And so many people, so many hope has been vanished because of the flawed system. So many homes have been destroyed because of the flawed system. And so many lives has been shattered because of the flawed system. And I have nothing but I want to humbly request the government and to review and to reform the flawed system as nothing is perfect. And that is not beneficial to anyone. And I also humbly uh, uh, plead the department to think twice before making a final judgment or decision that can affect an individual for the rest of their life, like, like it, had, it had happened to me. And let me stop here and thank you for keeping my hope alive in this wonderful island. Thank you. Um, I'm making a second. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think as as I said after Annie spoke, you know, I think we, we can another instance where we can almost leave it there. Um, you know, when you take away procedures, legislation, policy, you know, documents, statutory instruments, you know, you take away the noise and the legal. And the procedural approaches to immigration at the very heart of it is people and at the very heart of it is people with dreams and with so much to give um, and the responsibility you spoke of feeling that you have towards Ireland is a responsibility that Ireland has towards you as well um, and we as an organization try to embody that um, and, and try to embody everything that, that we can do to, uh, to make that happen. Um, but Ireland as a country has a responsibility. As you say, it has a responsibility to improve these things. You know, humans first. Legislation and policies support that, but humans first, you know. And that's what human rights is at the end of the day. So thank you for your words and thank you for the courage that you speak with. Um, and uh, you'll get there. You'll get there. You have a strong heart, you know. Um, so uh, I have been reminded to ask you all to, to put questions if you have them into the comments section. We have a couple of questions in there, but after our next speaker, we will go to questions and, uh, and um, we will do our best to try and, uh, try and uh, respond to as many as we can before 11.30. So the last person I'd like to introduce you to is Caroline Minnick. Uh, Caroline Minnick is a pro bono associate at Arthur Cox and is responsible for managing the firm's pro bono practice. Uh, Caroline has a wealth of not-for-profit experience prior to joining Arthur Cox. Um, she worked uh, with the Irish Rule of Law International in Malawi, with the International Development Law Organization in Afghanistan and South Sudan, and with the uh, Internews Network in Thailand. And before that, she worked as a solicitor in Dublin with um, Invesco. Invesco. Um, so a huge amount of experience there as well, Caroline. And uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, the pro bono support that we receive 
through Arthur Cox has been an amazing support to our, our legal team. And as Heikel demonstrated there with what he spoke to what he spoke about, you know, at the heart of our legal team is people. At the heart of our legal team is people trying to access their rights. Um so I'll hand over to you, Caroline, and then we'll go to questions after that. So um if everyone can please put in some questions if you have them and we'll we'll come to them after Caroline. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brian, and lovely to speak with everybody this morning. As Brian mentioned, I work with Arthur Cox as pro bono associate, and I was the first pro bono ever to be appointed by the firm just last year, and the second pro bono associate ever to be appointed in Ireland, uh, which I think is an important thing to highlight because it shows the firm's commitment to helping those most in need and the organisations like the ICI that help them access justice. The quality of our pro bono work is really linked to our relationships with the NGO community, which is why our partnership with the Immigrant Council of Ireland is so important. As you mentioned there, it's people that are at the heart of the work that we do. And um, through our work with the Immigrant Council, we can make sure that we're helping those people most in need. We've been working together for a number of years through a secondment programme whereby Arthur Cox places secondees with the Immigrant Council of Ireland on a rolling basis for up to six months at a time. This is a really beneficial project, especially for trainees who help can, who can help access just and help people access justice and engage in hands-on and reward, rewarding work. In 2019, we were really able to strengthen our relationship and launch an additional two activities, as Catherine mentioned. Firstly, through our collaboration with Immigrant Council of Ireland and other partners as well as an international NGO called KIND, we've been able to take on cases representing unaccompanied refugee minors apply for family reunification. This is really rewarding work for us to be involved in. It helps us help those who need our assistance most. It's something that we wouldn't be able to do without our partnership with the Immigrant Council of Ireland, who provides really practical and technical training on family reunification. The Immigrant Council also refers the cases to us and provides ongoing support as we manage the cases and apply for applications for our clients. The second project that we launched earlier this year, as Catherine mentioned, was staffing the Immigrant Council's evening helpline that runs on a Tuesday evening. And this was a really worthwhile project because we had such a huge level of engagement across the firm with over 30 volunteers for the helpline. It's really beneficial way for us to engage with people to help help them with their immigration questions and uh, replying to their queries and it's a way that we can provide access to legal information and help people better understand their rights. Through all of these projects we've been able to foster a mutually beneficial relationship, benefits to ourselves, the people that we're seeking to help and to the council. The Condies have gained particular personal insights regarding the representation of vulnerable clients, including victims of domestic violence, victims of human trafficking, and have assisted in reuniting families. And by placing the Condies with the Council, we've increased the Council's capacity to represent clients and carry out advocacy and policy work on behalf of migrants and their families. Through our partnership with the Immigrant Council, we've been able to help people most in need, making sure that they're at the heart of the work that we're doing by providing access to legal information and direct representation. And this is really important to our work because as part of our pro bono policy at Arthur Cox, we want to make sure that we're taking on pro bono cases in areas of high unmet legal need with an emphasis on work that we have that will have a long-term impact. And there's also been quite a number of unexpected benefits for ourselves at the firm because through our partnership with the council, We've been able to work with a more diverse range of clients. We've developed new skills in areas of law, such as family reunification. And we also benefit from the Council's very practical and specialised trainings in areas of immigration law. So I think over the last year, we've seen our partnership really expand to include additional activities so that we can help more people at the end of the day. But of course, the more work that we do, the more work that we see that there is to be done. But we're delighted to be able to continue to work alongside Catherine and the ICI team to see how we can continue to expand and grow our partnership and help those that need it most. Thank you, Brian. I'll pass it back to you. 
Thank you, Carol. And, and um, yeah, I, as I said um, before I introduced you there, that the, the support that we get as, as, a, as a small independent law centre from Arthur Cox is phenomenal. And it does help us to deliver on those cases to such a huge extent. And there's a mutual learning there as well, I think both ways, which is which is really beneficial to us. Um, you know, as, as we mentioned in the impact report, so 5,000 calls, over 5,000 calls to the helpline queries to the helpline service, 199 legal cases, then strategic cases pulled out for, for representation and advice, and then five high court cases last year, one of which we won, thankfully, and, and then this year at the moment, the Supreme Court case ongoing. So for a small organization like us, that's, that's a significant legal output, and the support that we get from yourselves is so phenomenal in that regard as well. Um, and, I, and I think, to be honest, it, it highlights one of the areas whereby integration and migration are so complex and they're so multifaceted and as i said earlier it's, it's a human being at the end of the day who has legal needs or has social needs there's all kinds of different needs around them that it's only through working in partnership that we're actually going to get anywhere and it's only through working in partnership that we're going to, to get these issues progressed and um, so to have uh, you know as prominent an agency as Arthur Cox on side with us is, uh, is, is something that's really inspirational as well so thank you for that and thank you for the work that you do um, so you've, uh, we've heard from, from all of our speakers this morning. Um, there isn't a huge amount of questions coming in in the sidebar, I have to say. Um, so maybe uh, I think the power and depth maybe of some of the speakers we've had this morning might have uh, taken the emphasis away from asking questions. So if there are any questions, uh, please put them in there and we can try and respond to them. There was a question earlier about institutional racism in, in, in the private sector. And, and I think it's, it's a very pressing question this morning when we see the report that has come out as well from the ESRI. Um, many of you may have seen that this morning, where they're reflecting upon the fact that many people from a migrant background come to Ireland with extremely high qualifications and extremely high um, uh, educational levels, but that is not transferred necessarily into the level at which they work in the workplace for a start, but also as well, the level of unemployment among migrant communities has always traditionally and is still at the moment and unfortunately going into a recession in the next while will still be um, overly, um, rep overly impactful on, on people from a migrant background. Um, we work or increasingly starting to work with the private sector around their hiring policies, around their diversity strategies and internal anti-racism strategies. We've done a lot of work with different county councils and others in the last number of years around internal procedures, around anti-racism, around diversity, around hiring strategies to make sure that they're, they're opening the door to people from a migrant background and they're not missing out on that but they're also giving people the opportunity to go and work in those areas. Um, we're beginning to do that work in the private sector as well because we feel there's a, a huge lack of knowledge for a start. People don't understand different migration statuses because the migration statuses themselves are complex and because they're, they're often very differing in the type of rights that they will give to a person. Um, I think a lot of it can be conscious bias. A lot of it can be unconscious bias as well whereby some of these qualifications may be disregarded, or indeed their ethnicity, their, their, their country of origin, the experience that they gained there may be not taken into account as having the same weight as somebody who's had similar experience in Ireland. So there's a huge body of work to be done in the private sector, absolutely, to make sure that the recruitment policies and the procedures then internally for people to progress through the workplace are in place. Um, and, and I think that that's something that we are, we are absolutely uh, focused on in our work, but it's not something we can do ourselves. It's, it's something that the private sector needs to take on and to own. We are members of a, a partnership called the Open Doors Initiative, which is over 40 private sector employers who have committed to taking on and to giving employment opportunities to people from different disadvantaged backgrounds. So it's people for young people from disadvantaged communities, people from, with disabilities, and also people from, who are asylum seekers and refugees. And um, it's in its very early stages, I think it's probably fair to say it, it really began over the last 12 months, 12 to 18 months. And um, there's huge interest in the private sector in signing on to it. And we're beginning to see it thawing out in terms of the policies and procedures they have around recruitment. So it's very positive to have that an initiative like that. But again, it's only one strand. Uh, and I think that there's a, a huge amount that needs to be done around recruitment procedures um, in the private sector. So, so that's, that's a very pertinent question uh, and a very um, important sector. Um, 
as we mentioned in some of our commentary earlier this morning about the impact report, diversity is not represented in in political in the political area. It's not represented in the corporate or private sector area. It's not represented even in the civil service necessarily, particularly at the high levels. Things like the media as well. These are issues that we need to move along. If we don't move these along, we will deal with the repercussion of that further down the road. Young people growing up in Ireland from a migrant background need to see themselves represented in these levels and they need to know that that's a possibility for them. Um, as Annie said, we're doing it and those that are, are putting themselves forward like that are doing it for their kids, you know. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question maybe. Um, Annie, you spoke very strongly and very powerfully about the impact of racism and, and I think something that doubles the impact of racism is a denial of it. So in the last week, we've had a lot of commentary about racism in Ireland, but we've also had a lot of commentary about the fact that there's no racism in Ireland. It doesn't happen. It's not a thing here. We don't have to worry about it because it's not potentially as visible as the images we saw with George Floyd being killed on the street uh, in, in the US. Um, can you speak a little bit about, in your experience, you know, the reluctance maybe people may have to report racism or indeed how that kind of denial of racism doubles down on the impact of racism, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's no problem at all. So um, for me personally, and I'm talking in terms of what I have experienced, all of us experience it a bit differently. Um, so the people in direct provision will experience it in a way that they're in isolation. So even when they come out, the so-called Irish humor, you know, is where people are in denial and making fun of the, you know, of the situation or things like direct provision. Or even if we see when the coronavirus came out, the fact that people were actually going out and now attacking the Chinese people, you know what I mean? But to them, it's humor. So even right, like now when um, all of us are out here speaking about the inhumane and how Irish people have treated us, people are saying we're trying to paint it to look like Irish, Irish people are not welcoming. We are ruining the view of what Ireland stands for because technically the Irish people are the blacks of Europe. But if you look at that, that's the kind of sense that they have, it kind of waters down what they're doing. So if you've listened to any of the stories that have come up at the moment, especially let's say for the mixed race children, right? You're finding that they don't belong in the Irish community because they're not white enough, or they don't really belong in the black community because they're not black enough. They're somewhat in between. So it's very hard to get accepted, yes. but yet the racism and the discrimination is predominantly there. Then you come to the fact that most of us are afraid of reporting because of the kind of like the whiplash and the back effect of what happens. So if you can look at the people reporting things about direct provision, most of them are being transferred to the most remote back ends of nowhere. So they're being punished for voicing their voices. Then you find the people like us who are out here, who are not in direct provision, but we are citizens and we're speaking out of it. We're being trolled on social media, being called so many names, but yet a lot of us are also afraid to go to the, uh, to the Gardaí because again, we're seeing nothing is being done. So we are all afraid of going out there because we cannot see any results of the reports we're doing or anything like that. Hence the reason why, you know, I encourage people to actually contact the ICI if anything like that happens, INA, AKIDWA, any of those organizations. But at the same time, we have to be realistic. There is no information out there that helps people like us. And it's not just us, but if you look at even the fact that the Irish are actually racist among themselves, which I found absolutely, you know, gobsmacking in the fact that the Irish people, just because you're from Cork, they'll actually discriminate against you in Dublin. Do you know what I mean? You go to Wicklow, they'll discriminate you because you're from Wexford or somewhere else. So I wouldn't say it's um, like tribalism where we, like in Africa, if you look at the way Africa is, a Kikuyu will always discriminate against a certain tribe. But that's just the way things are. Do you know what I mean? Which has been very um, common here, which I'm finding a little bit worrying that everybody thinks it's banter. 
but you do not see the hurt it's causing, the amount of people who have committed suicide because of it. Why should you use someone else's misfortune as a joke? It doesn't work that way. Because I can guarantee you that the Irish people who are going through it in America, the Irish people who have gone through it in London, in England, are not going to see it that way. It's the same as with the government. The government at the moment is going around saying we need to voice out the Irish, you know, people who are in, are in the US and try and get them known. But yet back home, they're turning around and saying, well, these immigrants, these aliens, so it's also starting from the language we're using from up top. And unfortunately, it's rippling down through the other people because what we see as leaders, a lot of us are mimicking, which is not funny anymore. And as I said, we can see the train wreck coming, but yet we are not standing up for it. So do we have to wait until something like, you know, Floyd happens or something else in Ireland for us to realize like, hold on, this is what is happening in Ireland, and we can no longer deny it. We can no longer ignore it. I'm sorry I'm very passionate about this, but it breaks my heart to sit down and have, whether it's my neighbors or people out there, or even the fact that I am fully qualified, but yet I cannot get a job because I am not educated in Irish eyes. I am not educated enough to get that particular job that I want to do. Hence the reason why you're finding a lawyer could be driving a taxi. Do you know what I mean? A psychologist, a doctor, all that is actually built into the society which needs mm -hmm. to change. We still have another 40 minutes, Frank. So hopefully that answers your question, Brian. And this is something of my passion and I know I'm talking too much, but it is really yeah. heartbreaking to see people who are willing to use their talents, who are willing to use their own time and the things that they have being thrown down the drain because of the ignorance of the government, the ignorance of the people of high power and the fact that they do not want to listen. Most of them are glued on those seats. It's like a family thing where a TD will give that to their sons, even though they're not qualified enough for that particular job they will not give it away. Is it an entitlement for other people? And it's not. And it's, it shows a great divide in the Irish community where none of us are willing to look at the root cause of all these problems. But unfortunately, unless we are willing to change as a people and we're willing to change individually to see what is going on in Irish community, Unfortunately, it's not going to change until such times something hits us hard. So if you can look at even the movement of the LGBTQ, it took one massive thing to happen for the whole thing to change and the whole thing to shift. And now we have equality for them. We have equal marriage. The same thing with abortion. One person passed away and the whole movement shifted. Do we have to wait until one of us as a migrant, as a minority, to happen so that things can change? So hopefully that answers your question and I didn't take too much time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Annie. You absolutely do not have to apologize for taking time, believe me. Um, and, I, and I think it, it, it's very true what you say, and I think it almost points to a kind of a normalization of racism and, and maybe there has always been a normalization of racism in Ireland because pre-migration and pre-diversity in that regard, we had a traveling community who have long suffered from being segregated and long suffered from being vilified and long suffered from being, you know, lacking opportunities in so many regard. And in some ways it was potentially easy for that, that lack of uh, dignity to be transferred onto a new group, you know, um, and I think, as you say, the normalization of it is, is particularly devastating um, when you consider young people growing up in Ireland who are feel no different from the kids that are beside them in the class, who absolutely, as far as they're concerned, are Irish kids, but have it pointed out to them by some that there is a difference, that it's their skin color or their religion or the fact that their parents have come from a migrant background. And, and one of the things we've heard so many times is the shock, the shock of a young child being told 
figuring out, wait a second, some of these people think I'm different. Something here is not right. And that begins a process. That's, that's a, 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 a deviation from the norm for that young person. It's very, very hard to recover from. It's very hard to get that young person back into feeling like Ireland is their home again, you know? So the personal responsibility you mentioned for each and every one of us is massive in that regard. And I think as well, the high level responsibility uh, to have something like a national action plan against racism. It sounds like, oh, okay, a policy response, great. But we have not had a national action plan against racism in Ireland since 2008. And we have had a large scale denial of the fact that racism even exists here in Ireland. Without that, we are lacking in the infrastructure, we're lacking in a coordinated response, and we're lacking in the resources to actually tackle racism, support victims of racism, and deal with misinformation around people. You know, so we need official strategies. Uh, now I'm speaking too long, <laughs> so I apologize again. Um, but um, thank you for that, Annie. There's been a couple of other questions that have come in in the meantime that I, I, I'd like to address. Um, one of them has been the, the relation, the, actually, sorry, before I go to that one, there's a related question that I, I'd like to respond to that came in um, separately, actually, just to, to Pippa there as regards the seeming increase in, in the number of racist incidents reported both to ourselves and the, like, of the likes of uh, Inar Ireland um, over the last couple of years. Um, now, um, Inar Ireland operate the iReport um, online reporting tool, so I, I'd urge a lot of you to look at that and look at the reports that they have there. They have their 2019 statistics out, which show over 500 incidents reported uh, through the portal, but also they put out their recent statistics as well for 2020 that show again a doubling of those statistics um, from this period last year. So some of that potentially can be attributed to the fact that there has been um, an increased awareness around the ability to report and a lot of work being done to encourage people to report, but a lot of it has come down as well towards things like the general election. So in the general election this year, a lot of reports were received, particularly to INR, about comments made by elected officials or want to be elected officials that vilified migrants, that vilified people from different ethnic minority backgrounds. And those things were reported into uh, the likes of INR through the, through the IR report portal. And um, so again, the responsibility that somebody who wants to be an elected official or somebody who is an elected official to to mine the narrative around the type of things that they say, or to mine the narrative around how they're willing to cross a line into vilifying migrants and vilifying others for what they perceive as potential electoral gain is massively impactful. It isn't just a passing ship in the night. It is something that is very, very impactful upon, uh, upon diverse communities here in Ireland and needs to be pushed back against. As Annie mentioned as well, the whole COVID-19 situation has, has, has led potentially to an, and, and I think verifiably to an increase in, in racist incidents, particularly towards people of Chinese or Asian origin, because of the perceived um, blame uh, in inverted commas that that some would perceive they hold towards towards the, the the pandemic being spread. So I think there's a couple of particular things that 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 contributed towards the increase, but I think as well um, the fact that there is increased narrative around reporting racial incidents and there is increased opportunity. But again. INAR is a civil society led initiative. It's not a state initiative. It's not, it's not um, provided for at that level like the NCCRI used to do back in 2008. And again, if those statistics are not collated by the state in a comprehensive and, and verifiable and researchable way, um, it's very easy for the state in inverted commas again to, to, to say that racism doesn't exist, you know. Um, so I think there's, there's work being done there, but there's a huge amount that needs to be done to support people who are experiencing racial incidents in Ireland. We're trying to do a small part of that. Civil society in general is trying to do a small part of that, but the state is reneging in its responsibility in that regard. Um, sorry, another speech from me. There you go. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that was asked as well is in relation to COVID-19, the impact upon the, uh, the services or the, the people that we support through our services. So at the moment, about 80% of the queries on our helpline are COVID-19 related. So there are people from a migrant background who have 
um, are working predominantly in essential services. So they're working in the health sector, they're working in retail, they're going about their business. But also as well, it's, it, it, it highlights for us the fragility of their immigration status versus the contribution that they're making through those jobs. So a lot of the questions we're getting are, what would be the impact if I lose my job and I get the pandemic payment? Will I be able to apply for citizenship in the future? Will they renew my immigration status? Um, a lot of it has been around the registration issues because you need to go to the guards to renew your card but the GNIB is closed at the moment. Now, thankfully, the Department of Justice has extended that status a couple of times to, to, to manage the fact that there will be gaps in people's status. Um, but it is a very ad, ad hoc kind of an approach, I suppose, uh, and highlights the fact that actually our immigration system is quite outdated. It's not, it doesn't translate easily into an online format um, and does need to be modernized in that regard as well. But one of the issues that we'd like to highlight as well as it was are people from, from a migrant background who are undocumented. And some of them are providing essential services and are working in jobs that are that are essential during the pandemic as well. And Annie, you mentioned it earlier, our, our, the Irish government will lobby and advocate in the US for the regularization of undocumented Irish people there, but very, very slow to recognize the fact that undocumented people here in Ireland need regularization too. Um, and, and that's that's something that has been highlighted further again by, by undocumented people in the current pandemic situation as well. You know, the disparity between the status they have and the contribution that they're making. Um, so um, I'm not sure if I'm missing other questions or if other questions have come in. One of the questions is what are our priorities as an organization going forward? And I think it probably would take me another hour to describe the length and breadth of things that we're doing and proposing to do. Um, but I'd urge you to have a look at our website and our social media and our, and our Twitter and Facebook um, to follow us and, and, and to keep in touch with us. And on our website as well, you'll see our strategic plan. Essentially, our, our backbone is service provision. So we are dedicated to the, to the concept of, of information and access to justice. We're dedicated to the concepts of legal representation for people from a migrant background and giving them access to justice and working in partners with, partnership like with Arthur Cox to try and develop that further. Um, that's the backbone of the organization. From that, we continue our work around and anti-trafficking, um, migrant women and domestic violence is another large area of our support work. Young people from a migrant background, either unaccompanied minors or in situations where their family units are broken down, is a massive part of our work as well. On the integration side of the house, we have our pillars of political participation, anti-racism, national and local level integration planning and leadership as well you know we've met some fantastic people like Annie uh, through our legal through our, our internship scheme we've run leadership courses in the past as well where, where, which we were, we were hoping to run again this year um, whereby we, we seek to use whatever expertise we have and the contacts we have to help people um, to, to, to learn the skills around advocacy, learn about the Irish policy landscape, learn how to interact with the media in Ireland. Um, so our leadership scheme will be running later this year as well, and we'll be looking forward to, to running that. Um, so yeah, so, so we do what we can, many spinning plates, and we're probably trying to do too much, but we do it in partnership with others, and, and the saving grace of it is that we get to meet fantastic people through doing it. Um, to wrap up, because we're, we're gone a little bit past 11, uh, 11.30, and, and I would um, apologize to you for that, but I think it's been a very rich and fruitful conversation and, and a very impactful one. And I think Haikal and Annie articulated things way better than I can and way better than, than we as an organization can. The human impact of migration and the human people, the human beings at the heart of migration are the strongest part of what we do and are, the, are the, the, the strongest voices as regards what needs to happen to reform and change and improve our immigration and integration approach here in Ireland. We have so much we can do and we're at a crossroads and we have choices to make. Um, and I think we need to make the right choices um, lest we go down roads that other countries around us have, have, have gone down. And we don't want to get to those places. Uh, and the fire is already lit here, as Annie said, around issues like racism, they need to be addressed. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank our staff. Um, as you can see from the impact report, is a phenomenal level of work has come out of the organization. Um, and I think at the end of 2019, everybody was exhausted. Um, but the dedication and the commitment and the professionalism that our staff um, uh, give to the work um, is every day inspirational, you know? Um, and for me as CEO, 
and it is just you know I stand back in awe most of the time and just let them at it because they're they're phenomenal a phenomenal group of human beings. Um, so thank you all for that, and thank you to Pippa and Robert and Alva, and others who set up the, the, the webinar this morning. Um, I'd like to also thank all of our funders at the back of the impact report. You'll see a list of all our funders like Pubble, CIB the app funding received from the Department of Justice, the Religious Sisters of Charity, the Tomar Trust, many, many supporters. And we thank you all for the support, the support that we received from you. We are an, an NGO, a charitable organization, and the support that we receive is, is massive. But I guess it would be remiss of me not to mention that at the moment, like many charities in Ireland, we're suffering under the impacts of COVID-19 as regards our training, our ability to fundraise and different things like that. So all of you out there, we can support other civil society organizations that are suffering at the moment as regards to the difficulties that are going on. Please do. Uh, the charitable sector needs your help at the moment as well as many other sectors in Ireland. So, so what's left for me to do before I think my internet goes, it says my internet connection is unstable, so I better stop talking. They're going to cut me off. Um, is thank you all again for coming today. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the staff. Um, Keep fighting the good fight, uh, and it's a pleasure and an honor and a privilege to work with you all. So, thank you all, everybody, and take care and stay safe out there.